Eleven years ago, I was starring in a new play in this theater in the West End. After just three performances, I walked out. In the early hours of the next morning, I came down from my flat in central London to this lane. I went into my garage, sealed the door with a duvet I brought, and got into my car. Sat there for at least, I think, two hours in the car, my hands on the ignition key. It was a, you know, it was a suicide attempt, not a, not a cry for help. I drove to the south coast and took a ferry to Europe. I just knew I couldn't be at home, I couldn't be in London, I couldn't be in England. I really believed that I would never come back to England. Run away, Stephen Fry broke his silence last night to reveal the torture he's been suffering. They all are worried that I've committed suicide, that's the awful thing. But after a week, I secretly returned to England to this hospital and to a doctor telling me that I was bipolar. I'd never heard the word before, but for the first time, at the age of 37, I had a diagnosis that explained the massive highs and miserable lows I'd lived with all my life. There's no doubt that I do have extremes of mood that are greater than just about anybody else I know. The psychiatrist in the hospital recommended I take a long break. I came here to America, and for months I saw a therapist and walked up and down this beach. My mind was full of questions. Am I now mad? How have I got this illness? Could it have been prevented? Can I be cured of it? Since then, I've discovered just how serious it is to have bipolarity or manic depression, as it's also called. Four million others in the UK have it and many of the seriously ill end up killing themselves. So I've decided to speak out about my mental illness, and it is a mental illness. I want to talk to others who have it about what triggered it in them and how it took over their lives, and I want to find out answers to what still worries me. Was I diagnosed correctly, and am I getting better or worse? Let's start with a remark made by a Hollywood producer to me. You don't need to be gay or Jewish to get on here, just bipolar. He meant, of course, larger than life, furiously energetic, endlessly creative. Manic types do well in Hollywood, in all of show business for that matter. Euphoric highs and crippling lows seem to go with the territory and don't attract the stigma found everywhere else. Since my own diagnosis, I've kept working and found ways to cope. And I've also kept quiet about my condition. Now I want to speak out, to fight the stigma, and to give a clearer picture of a mental illness most people know little about. Visiting my old friend Carrie Fisher, known to the world as Princess Leia in the Star Wars movies, but she's always been... She's on the edge of sanity. She's, um, you know, constantly... Not, you know, not mad enough to be committed, but not sane enough to, to lead much of a normal life. galloping along at a great speed, it is better than any drug that you could ever take. God, if you will, is saving you parking spots. Songs are being played on the radio for you. You're just so enthusiastic about everyone. And everyone must be enthusiastic about you. And it's just, come along, I've got a great idea. I've got this unbelievable idea. Let's go to India. <laughs> exactly. Then you'll just start going way too fast. Yeah. And you're faster than anyone that you're around. And that's not fun. You're on the phone far too long. You're not getting any sleep. 
Nothing is going fast enough for you. Come on, keep up with me, you guys, come on. And even if it's not true that you're um, more talented when you're manic, you feel like you are. Yeah, which is half so the battle. I am standing on rocks, claiming speeches to the world. You know, I have a lot to say. I have messages from deep space, in fact. And I stayed awake for six days, and I, I did lose my mind. And this friend of mine says to me, does your doctor know that you behave this way? <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> then we sort of have an argument, and I cry for four hours, and I'm unable to stop. And I know there's something wrong with that. I call this doctor, and I go in, and I see her. You know, we're talking, and I'm laughing, and I'm spinning around in chairs. And the doctor says... That's, that's the diagnosis. That's bipolar. That's manic depression. Carrie had years of living with such extreme moods and feelings before she got that diagnosis. She's got it bad, you know. It's not a rock star, film star uh, accessory. It's a, it's a real mental condition that she has to live with every single day of her life. She's on medication. You, you have to picture what she'd be like if she weren't. A medical expert told me almost half of those suffering from manic depression aren't diagnosed at all. Frightens me to think of people having symptoms like Carrie and not knowing what's wrong with them. I'm told it's an illness that's surprisingly difficult to pin down to achieve a diagnosis. Now, I'm diagnosed bipolar, and bipolarity is a disease of the brain. So a brain scan will surely reveal a sign of what I have. The research being carried out here at the Maudsley Hospital in South London compares normal brains with bipolar ones like mine. So we're coming right to the oh front of the brain. Oh my goodness, that's okay. my answer. And so yes. you're just grab, grabbing the front of the nose and then, and then we'll scroll back through. <laughs> that's okay. my face virtually. And these little chubby, chubby cheeks there as my well. My little chubby cheeks. But by looking at a sample of slices from a mm. brain, you can't tell, or can you, whether someone is bipolar or... When it comes to bipolar, looking at a single subject's structural scan would not give you no. diagnostic information at this stage. Is there anything you see in my brain that leads you to the view that I am bipolar? No, uh, I think it's the short, answer, the very right. short answer to yeah. that. So there is as yet no brain test that can diagnose bipolarity. But I've been hearing talk of a bipolar gene. To find out more, I've come to have my DNA tested as part of the world's largest study of bipolarity based here at Cardiff University. They have 2,000 subjects already and now for 2001. Do I get my wally pop now? Yeah. <laughs> so, this is your DNA. My DNA, thank you so much. Oh, it's so attractive. I knew it would be. <laughs> it's beautiful, isn't it? Ooh. So, which way now? OK, so we'll, we'll go up to look at the uh, sequinome. You know it must be good just from the name, It's don't fantastic. You? Yeah. Welcome to the sequinome, Mr yeah. Bond. What we have found this is this that thing. if you simply compared people with bipolar disorder against people without controls, we don't actually see any overall difference. Unfortunately, the press, you know, as you know, they'll publish reports saying the bipolar gene or, you know, whatever. And it, it's, that's completely incorrect. There'll be many genes that are involved in bipolarity. So at the moment, there is no clear-cut test to show if someone is bipolar. How then do you tell? How was I diagnosed all those years ago? Well, a psychiatrist simply asked a lot of questions about my behaviour and my feelings. At Cardiff, Nick uses the same process, but involving 200 questions to carefully build up a picture of a person's life history of manic depression. We've developed a scale. When I've found out information from you, I'll tell you where you score on our scale. Right. Looking back, times when you think perhaps it it was something a bit out of the ordinary or unusual, caused a problem or you needed treatment? Well, I suppose the first time I needed treatment, I think I was 14. In hindsight, my symptoms really surfaced here. 
But the problem for almost everyone was that they just looked like bad behaviour. I was nearly expelled from my prep school. I was expelled from here. It's very strange revisiting a place where one was so intensely alive as to be um, almost in a constant state of edginess and I suppose what one call mania now. Because I cut games, I was so often alone, um, wandering around on the roofs. I think I used to crawl all over the roof for a mixture of risk and power when you're looking down on people. The, the effect of my behaviour was, of course, to make me unbearable, really. I mean, I, I, it's a show-off and loudmouth and um, completely impossible to handle and disruptive. Oh, my God. No. See, thin. <laughs> I, may, I may never have been a good-looking boy, but I was once thin. <laughs> I got out to fry fire. Oh, no. <laughs> Meeting my old housemaster and his wife ensures an uncomfortable reminder of past crimes, like being given permission to go to London and then not returning. We went to see films. We just went nuts. Yeah, that's right. Cinema. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, one, of, one of which was The Clockwork Orange. That's right. My father thought, oh, my God, all the films that he might have seen. <laughs> But I was consumed and gripped by it. Well, yes. you should have been back. Uh, a lot earlier. I had the Metropolitan Police out looking for I didn't realise that. I never realised that. Stephen has been a problem. <laughs> <laughs> There's a letter from Gerard Horne. That um, psychiatrist. Suggesting various things, um, adolescent depression, mild depressive illness rather than just unhappiness. Behaviorally, he can be quite infantile. I think Mr. Fry, that's your father, yeah. may have mentioned that the advice given to him by doctors in London suggests that he might have some brain damage to account for this. That's a crude way of... Good Lord! Uh, we were not aware of any drug taking or sexual offences, however. Phew! Oh. Well, gosh, <laughs> he didn't know much then. <laughs> <didn't> <laughs> <know. laughs> And then the awful thing, which is the stealing, mm. that uh, gripped me. Couldn't have, you didn't need money. You didn't no. need to steal. No. It was so odd. No. So you didn't know it, would be, it was I who was the... Uh, I, I, I wouldn't have suspected it at all, Stephen, no. You laid a trap in Matron's... Oh, yes. We did, well, which Elizabeth... That was you. Were, you, were, you were hiding in, in, in Matron's I room. was in her bathroom. Yes. It was a terrible shock to see mm. you. Strange emotional turmoil I was in. Stealing things that I couldn't possibly want, you know. As well as stealing money, it must be said, which I did want, I suppose. Did I feel shame when I stole things? I suppose I did. But there's something very extraordinary about going through, you know, going through a room where you're not supposed to be looking for things. And it's like when you watch it in a movie, you know, when the hero's burgling somebody's flat or something. It's very nerve-wracking. Your heart is in your throat. And it's a real buzz. And considering I didn't do any sports or anything else that gave me any kind of adrenaline rush, which sport is supposed to do, maybe that was... Maybe that's what it was. Whether it was part of a disorder that can be given a name, I don't know. It was bad enough for me to have to go to a psychiatrist anyway. That didn't lead to a diagnosis of manic depression, probably because, like the school authorities, like my parents, and to be fair, like me at the time, why would you have thought it was anything other than bad behaviour? So I was expelled and just stumbled on, continuing to steal as I went. By this time, I had progressed to credit cards stolen from the jackets of my parents' friends. This led to my next big manic episode, when I used the money in the most grandiose way. When I was about 17, um, going around London on a stolen credit card, it was a sort of fantastic reinvention of myself, an attempt, you know, I bought ridiculous suits with stiff collars and silk ties from the 1920s and would go to the Savoy and the Ritz and uh, drink cocktails. The morality of it never crossed my mind at all. I think it's more that when you're in a sort of 
grip of a, a manic fantasy, you don't really believe other people exist. You are the centre of your universe. I wanted to be in there. That's what I, uh, that, and Stephen Fry is sitting there. And the white coats are so appropriate, aren't they, the barman? But they're nurses in a, in a wonderful mental hospital. It didn't, of course, last. After months of travelling the country using my stolen credit card, I was arrested. I was sent to Puckle Church Remand Centre. So, um, this is kind of what, in my day, would have been a long, sterile corridor with cell doors and... Wow, I mean, it's just so, so different. I had spent the last ten years of my life, actually, at boarding schools of one kind or another. So this was... This was for me, it was nothing, really, to be honest. It was just... Instead of being called prefects or, or schoolmasters, they were called prison officers or screwed. The only thing that really twisted my guts was my mother coming to visit uh, on the first occasion she visited. And I used to be very keen on doing cryptic crosswords, at Times Crossword, things like that. And she had, all the time I'd been away, she'd cut out the Times Crossword every single day. And that sort of simple demonstration of love and being there for me and thinking of me was... Uh, you know, really stuck in my throat. How many times in your life would you have had an episode like that? I would think four or five of the, that extremity. If I'm to take my past history, then I, I sort of believe maybe it's perhaps every five years a huge storm will come. I don't know, okay. but that's sort of often the way it is. So when would the first time have been that you had a, um, a depression? I would think it was about six months before that manic experience, oddly enough. When you've been depressed like that, what's your self-esteem like? Oh, then? it's absolute zero. Stand up from a sofa and walk to the fridge is an act of unbelievable effort. Everything that happens is because you are a cunt. Because I'm a complete wanker, that's because I'm an arsehole. You, know, you, you, you kind of almost have a Tourette's view of yourself. You think of death all the time. I mean, even if yes. you're not getting suicidal, you're yeah. just constantly yeah. aware of death and aware of your own death and, and how welcome it would be. That's when I tried to kill myself. Right, so you'd have been. Would, 17. 17. It was tablets, was it? Yes, I took as many as I could, as many variations as I could in order to make them as toxic as possible. Unfortunately, it just made me projectile vomit. And I do remember absolutely that it was a, you know, it was a suicide attempt, not a, not a cry for help. Looking back through your life, just roughly how many episodes of depression like that do you think you've experienced, just roughly? I should say... five or six. I think Nick Craddock's getting the picture. But so am I. Adding up all that extreme behaviour is making me a little concerned about what my eventual score will be. Something that always bothers me is whether I could have avoided some of these harrowing moments if I'd just been diagnosed earlier. But that's actually now a very controversial issue, because in America, psychiatrists seem only too happy to diagnose children. As a result, Susie Jensen, who lives outside San Francisco, has known for five years that both her young teenage sons are bipolar. I'm Stephen Fry. Nice to meet you. How do you do? Thanks so much come for letting us come. Thank you. Absolutely, no problem. Is there a, a thing you can say, you know your child's bipolar when... Dot, dot, dot. You know your kid's bipolar when they're putting their feet through a plate glass window in a rage after they have been raging for three hours about something that you can't even remember what triggered. And certainly risky and dangerous behavior. I mean, yeah. Ian at one point went up on, we had an A-line roof, and he went up and was trying to walk the, the narrowest point of the A-line. You yeah. know, with his eyes closed. I didn't do it on the A little railway, extreme, you know. A, a, a li <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know your kid's bipolar when the behavior is so extreme that I had um, a neuropsych evaluation done on Ian. Yeah. And when I went to get the results of the testing, the psychiatrist, he met me in the lobby. He said, you know, I've just, in all the years that I've been doing this, I, I haven't been this concerned about you know, the results. And he went on to tell me a story that Ian had told him about he was walking into a room with bare feet and could feel 
a sensation under his feet that he couldn't recognize. Until all of a sudden he looked down and realized that it was my dismembered body all over the floor that he was trotting over. Um, now that is... <laughs> yeah, you don't want to hear that really, it's do you? concerning. How old is he then? Six. Six years old. Do you ever enjoy your menu, or do you find it a real, real uh, No, tough? I don't. No. I mean, I don't like it. No. No. So when you're doing something like bad, like throwing something or fighting in a bad mood in a fight or something. Yeah. Do you feel that's you and that you're right to be in a bad mood and the rest of the world is, I do. is shit? I do and sometimes, yeah. Yeah. I do. Diagnosed at 11, Ian's now 16. By that age, I'd already been expelled from school, so listening to him reminded me of my own it's attitude. It's actually, it's a drive. It's like it's feeding some need that he yeah. has. Yeah, that's you what I think, You can see too. it. You I can see it. It's, yeah, it's, 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 it is kind of the drive, some of my need, some of that happens. Ian's brother Todd is 13. He was diagnosed when only eight. His behaviour, even at the special school Susie has managed to get both boys into, is causing problems. While I am with her, she's called to the school. I'm normally not here until 2.30, but I got a call from the uh, administrator saying that Todd had had a difficult morning and had actually, um, unfortunately, thrown a chair at a staff member and, and hit him. Was there a reason we just cross? I was just, um, well, I just wanted to take a walk because I was kind of feeling pumped and angry, and they wouldn't let me do that, and so... Um, I just kind of got mad. You just got, just, yeah, frustrated. Yeah, and hurled the uh, chair at the guy. And I was about, I think it was about eight or nine, and there was a nurse at my school, and I was trying to do my laces up, and she told me to do double laces, and I didn't know how, what that meant. And I actually slapped her right across the face. And I, I've never known anything like that absolute rage inside me and I, it's really and it was such a stupid thing because she told me how to do my laces up after a blow especially a major one very often he'll just shut down like this i mean i know that he's suspended for three days he's been suspended for three, for three days, days. I know Todd's school sees it as bad behaviour, but I have to say I feel a twinge of sympathy. I recognise the rage, being in the grip of powerful feelings and the shame that comes afterwards. But Todd and Ian are different from me in one key respect at the same age. They know they have an illness. On the other hand, I know from speaking to psychiatrists in Britain that they don't agree with labelling children at such a young age. The norm in Britain is 19. So I wanted to speak to the consultant who diagnosed Ian and Todd. Are you having fun? Mm. What have you been doing? Kiki Chang is well placed to talk about this because not only does he run a research project at the prestigious Stanford University just outside San Francisco, <laughs> but also he has a two year old child and knows that some of his colleagues were diagnosed as young as that. Once you get down to, say, age two or three, it's very normal to have complete discontrol over your mood tantrums and crying one minute and laughing the next minute but I certainly have colleagues who are clear that they see it in three-year-olds even. Certainly I have seen children who I think were four and a half who fit the bipolar criteria. They're having wild mood shifts and they're having unsafe behavior, they're not functioning, they're not developing correctly, they're losing a lot of time in their normal development. Everyone remembers the rise of ADHD over the 80s and 90s. It's, and indeed, the cynics would always say, well, this is the new fashionable label to put on a bad kid, a disruptive I, I don't, kid. I want to be careful to say that. I don't think we're, we're, uh, we're over-diagnosing. I think that uh, by, by increasing the diagnosis, you're catching more people. It's good because then it leads them to a bipolar diagnosis and they realize that there's something going on that may be treatable and it's not their fault. Ian, come take your meds. For Kiki Chang, diagnosis is good news. For Ian and Todd, it means medication. Ian showed me just how much he takes every day. <laughs> Welcome to our pharmacy. Hey. <laughs> That's what I like We're proud of it. <laughs> so you've got Prozac, mm -hmm. Lamictal, mm -hmm. Adderall, mm -hmm. Clonopin's like a tranquilizer type? Yes. I can tell they help me uh, behave when I'm having a hard time. This is Ambien, which I take... Oh, sleeping pills, isn't it? Yeah, and... Cons Concerter, which I take in the morning. 
Concerta is, um, that's like Ritalin kind of. It takes me the better part of an hour to stand and fill both of their medications. All of that to take the edge off a 16-year-old's wilder behavior. What I think, I'm not sure. I know British psychiatrists are concerned about the harm strong drugs might do to young brains, especially when they're not 100% sure the diagnosis is correct. But if the drugs help Ian and Todd to avoid wrecking their lives and their mothers, then surely that's a good conclusion. So would I have wanted diagnosis at 16 if it meant being on medication since then? I feel that in some ways I've been helped by my manic depression, and that complicates my view. Would I have had success without it? Please welcome your host for the evening, Mr. Stephen Fry. Would you know me if I wasn't driven by its energy to be creative? Oh, stop it. Thank you. Thank you. How kind. I am delighted. Honoured, and let's not be coy about these things. Financially rewarded. This is a stressful time because, apart from anything else, you're making an ass of yourself, potentially, in front of people you admire. Now, stress is often a key factor that people say pushes them into manic depression, and certainly when I was diagnosed, the psychiatrist told me not to work so hard. Relax, avoid stressful situations. As you can see, I took his advice seriously. Enjoyable, some people might imagine this kind of thing is. They're the same kind of people who think it's enjoyable to have someone stub cigarettes out on your nipples in certain dark clubs and what I believe are called torture gardens in the leakier areas of the West End. Come in! And for the week leading up to it, I had the most appalling anxiety dreams in which I drop out of my clothes or I pee myself and it rolls off the front of the stage. Oh, God. I don't know if stress is what pushes me into a cycle of either mania or depression, because I can't think of a time in my life when I haven't been subject to stress. Happy? Yep. Happy? Ha! I remember that. Seven years old, ice cream, holidays. That was happy. <laughs> Not since then, really. <laughs> so, I, stress is something I, I can't live without. On the other hand, it is a dangerous thing. No disasters so far. But it's hot work. And I can't wait for it to be fucking over, frankly. Oh, God, here we go again. Because <laughs> I am delighted, honoured, and let's not be too coy about these things, financially rewarded to uh, welcome you to this most prestigious... Well, the real thing seems to go off OK for another year. I do manage to function despite my manic depression, and I'm sure it does help me to succeed. And that's the problem with connecting stress to the onset of manic depression. My stress is your easy day at the office. One person copes, the other goes mad. I've come to Cornwall to see how manic depression wrecked the career, the marriage, and almost took the life of a man who was once Lieutenant Commander on the Royal Yacht Britannia. Here we are, Princess Margaret one side, Lieutenant Commander Harvey there, and Majesty the Queen there. 22 years ago. And you were a well bunny then, That's weren't you? I mean... Oh, I was well. Four years on the Royal Yacht led to a senior posting in NATO. Under huge pressure working in a nuclear bunker, Rod became so deeply depressed he had a breakdown. My self-confidence seemed to be just um, seeping away and my self-esteem and, and I couldn't sleep. Awful sort of feeling of desperation. Eventually invalided out of the Navy, he still became secretary of the Royal Yacht Club in Plymouth. That lasted until, at a prize-giving ceremony, Rod, now manic, awarded it to the wrong person. The real winner wouldn't accept Rod's apology. Until, in the end, I just lost it, and um, in front of uh, all the spectators, I just shouted, oh, excuse my French, you know, fuck off! and marched off into the night. I actually hallucinated by seeing the devil burning black coals of these eyes of the devil. You know, that's what I saw. That was frightening.
I believed I was Jesus at the time, you know, though I didn't tell people that because then I wouldn't have been Jesus, you know. Yeah. Rod was brought back to England and sectioned at this psychiatric hospital in Plymouth. He was now overwhelmed with depression. I was experiencing pain in my head. I've been given a touch of hell. Yeah. I was meant to find out what hell feels. So I contrived to escape from the hospital. They let me leave the unit to go upstairs to turn right to the occupational therapy unit, unescorted, so I didn't turn right. I kept walking through the main doors to the dual carriageway, walked a bit down, away from the roundabout so that vehicles could pick up speed. Waited for a lorry to come along and then walked in front of it. I had actually compound fractures right. of, um, of both legs and every oh. bone in my legs. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh. I have to lower my trousers okay fair enough <laughs> to actually um see the full extent really i've seen um, a lot of naval officers in this condition don't worry <laughs> i'm not like this I don't oh think. my goodness no oh god that is really extraordinary can you just give a twirl as they say that is indicative of what must have been a savage injury that all happened over 10 years ago and with medication rod says his condition has now stabilized but twice a year, in the spring and in the autumn, he starts to feel the mania build again. And despite what's happened to him, he's reluctant to take extra medication to control it. I believe there is another world running in parallel to the normal, in inverted commas, boring, <laughs> which yeah. I find boring world, yeah. that there is another world and that the, the, the curtain gets lifted, the veil gets lifted when I'm psychotically manic yeah. and then I enter into the parallel world and then I see things in a totally different way. I will go into pubs and I will see angels, you know, I, I know that they know who I am and I know who they are. And we have a tremendous sort of um, bond between us because of a shared knowledge. Do you regret the fact that you were born with this strange disorder that is called bipolar or manic depression? It's a very easy question. Is it? No. It's a very easy answer. No. You don't regret it? No, not for a second. Because if you've walked with angels, all the pain and suffering is well worthwhile. Wow. You'll be pleased to know I don't see angels, or the devil, or think I'm Jesus. On the other hand, I agree with Rod. We manic depressives do love our manic periods. And I know that doesn't help diagnosis. When we're up, we're not ill. Don't be silly, we're fine. No need for a doctor. But that doesn't disguise the fact that Rod so nearly killed himself and that he really wanted to when he was in the grip of the other side of this illness. The legacy of any suicide for the family left behind is extremely painful. But when the cause is manic depression, suicide also leaves fear. The fear that the same thing might happen again with another member of the family, because manic depression is an illness that's always handed down in families. And that's what's brought me further down the coast in Cornwall to see an old friend who's had to live with that thought since he was 18. That's when he found out that his father was bipolar. Oh, I say. And this is where you would come. Every summer holiday? Yeah, we did, we were. It's great memories to, for me as a child, I must say. We just all used to sit out on that, um, the deck chairs on that slate bit down there. We used to have gnashings and lashings of lemonade. 
<laughs> well, we did. We did. <laughs> it's very um, famous five, isn't oh, it? Oh, isn't it? It's just wonderful. Just imagine having every summer holiday here. So, I mean, slightly mixed emotions you coming back here, I suppose. Well, yeah, because I mean, my father actually killed himself. Well, just over there, actually. So uh, it's not it's not the best. <laughs> One of the heartbreaking things about his suicide was that he actually went out with his sister, your yes, aunt, yes. and and threw himself off that cliff in yeah, front of him. He dived off, you know. So I mean, he wasn't messing about. They've all broken up a bit, but I'm trying to find a decent picture of him. There he is. That's your, that's your father. Yeah. The idea of having a loony father is just, you know, very sort of embarrassing and shameful, really. At 18, I, I was so keen to sort of hide the whole business, really. You know, you just want to be normal at that age, you know. Mm. I just became morbidly sort of aware of it and very, very depressed. And, and you get these panic attacks. My way of coping with it was to, to sort of like almost pretend it hadn't happened. As shortly after he died, I went away to Australia and America and Mexico for two years, just running away from it, really. Rick returned and built a huge success story just miles from where his father died. But he also spent his life wondering if he'd inherit the condition that made his father kill himself. I was always, you know, so worried then about ending up like him. The thing is that he thought I was p particularly like him, and I think he was incredibly uh, troubled by that. My father didn't sort of show signs of it till his mid-40s, really. So, I mean, I, you know... <laughs> Oh, I'm well over it now. <laughs> Fortunately. But, but then you think about my son, I think about my sons too. Of course you, you would, know. yeah. You know, my sons are still in their mid twenties, so there's plenty of yeah. plenty of time. Do you see a second? I do, I do. You do yeah. see a second, yeah. yeah. And that's helpful? Well it is. I do believe, but only probably through seeing the psychotherapist, that, that really what happens to you as a child is indelibly printed on your brain, you know, they fuck you up, your mum and dad, exactly. you know. What the research shows is that if you have manic depression, someone in your family will have had it before you. Could be a grandparent, aunt or uncle as well as a parent, and often they might not have been diagnosed. So there appears to be no warning, but there will be somebody. On the other hand, as Rick's experience shows, just because your father has it doesn't mean you'll necessarily get it. But the worry remains for bipolar parents. Will I pass it on? And now for bipolar mothers, researchers have made another devastating discovery. Pregnancy itself and the act of childbirth are now proved to be enormously dangerous to the mental health of women who are already bipolar. So when I saw you, Kenny, I, I said that, in my opinion, the risk that you had of becoming unwell again in pregnancy or certainly following the delivery were, were very high. I think probably 60% or more is the kind yes. of rate of, of risk that you, you, you'd need to, to think about. Gaynor Thomas lives in Wales and is part of the same research study that I'm involved in. She's trying to decide whether she dare risk getting pregnant again, knowing that her manic depression has already led to unusual behaviour. kind of delusions of grandeur. Did you believe you were richer than you were or better born or that you were, you know, some people believe they're princesses or... M mine were quite religious in, mm. in nature. One of the episodes, I thought that I was one of God's chosen people, for want of a better word. It, it, uh, I thought that I was able to um, heal people. Um, I thought I had kind of special powers. And I thought that I'd kind of been sent to gather together a group of people to change the world in some way. I was seeing a psychotherapist at the time and she identified that my ideas were becoming very strange and called in uh, what would have been the equivalent uh, of the community mental health team right. uh, who treated me at home. 
Yeah. With medication? With medication, yes. Right. And then came a very traumatic thing, a very wonderful thing for most people, which is pregnancy. Yep. And you did have a medic episode while yes. pregnant. And how did that show itself? So the more religious side came in after I'd had Thomas. Right. Oh, well, I just thought he was uh, not just a special baby, but a very special baby. So it's sort of like a messiah? Almost, almost to that degree, yes. Mm. Um, and that uh, I'd kind of been chosen to, to give birth to him and we, together we were going to change the world. It's such a small step and yet it's such a huge one in terms of embarrassment if you were to say it at a party. You know? yes. <laughs> There's a way of saying my child is the centre of my universe and saying my child is the centre of the universe. You think, um, Initially, it was kind of postnatal euphoria, right. uh, but it became postnatal mania. I couldn't sleep. I was so excited, called the psychiatrist and said, I think I need to see somebody because things are kind of getting out of control. Gaynor was sectioned in a psychiatric hospital for a month. The drugs the hospital put her on calmed her down, but now she's frightened that it might happen all over again if she gets pregnant. Ian Jones told me Gaynor is right to be scared. Women with bipolar disorder are at very high risk of having a much more severe episode of illness in relationship to childbirth, and often with psychotic symptoms like hallucinations or delusions. And really these episodes can be some of the most severe episodes of illness that we see in psychiatric practice. Really? In all psychiatric practice? The last two confidential inquiries Whee! into maternal death have showed us is that suicide is now the leading cause of death to women around childbirth in this country. Gaynor wants Thomas to have a brother or sister, but Ian Jones's information is hard to ignore. And it made me just rethink the whole idea of having a baby. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sad that I, I won't be able to have another child. Um, perhaps for Thomas's sake. But I've got to accept that uh, the risks are probably too high. Down the stairs we go. No. No, as you say, you don't know what might have happened. No, so. precisely. Slow down, slow down. <laughs> I love the heels of his shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Manic depression's capacity to destroy the lives of people makes it all the more important for it to be diagnosed early, but often it goes undetected because of what most sufferers do to help them cope with the mood swings. They cover up their symptoms. Certainly I did for almost 20 years. It's called self-medication, or as you would quite properly call it, the taking of excessive amounts of drink and drugs, vodka and cocaine in my case. The effect of it is, is that coke is a, is a stimulant and that alcohol is a, um, is a sedative, supposedly. And I'm naturally often so manic and uh, energetic that I often took coke to calm me down. But I found it very hard to go to any kind of party without knowing there were a couple of grams in my wallet, you know. It just, I just had to have them there. I feel slightly embarrassed about using a phrase like self-medication because it sounds like, you know, you're sort of excusing yourself or saying you're doing it for noble reason. I did find, and this is the point, that it, it, it stops one from from feeling in a strange kind of way. We've got an agenda to work out. You're no longer sort of depressed or manic. You're just kind of, you're just going, you're just on, you know? That's what I was doing all during my successful 80s and 90s. My friends, if they'd thought about it at all, would have said heavy user, not manic depressive. They'd have mistaken the symptoms for the cause, and that happens a lot. I did it with someone I went to university with, worked on the stage and telly with, and even made a film with. The first time it really manifested itself was at a time when I was doing this film, Peter's Friends. <laughs> I was having a gloriously happy time, and I was in employment, and I had money. All my personal life was happy, and so on paper there was absolutely no reason for me to be suddenly uh, plunged into uh, um, this, this sort of pit of abnormal psychology, this low mood. Good evening, and why don't you get a shovel in your hand and do a decent day's work, you lazy sod? You know, I wasn't drinking excessively then. I wasn't taking any kind of um, uh, psychotropic substance, either prescribed or proscribed, and it, it, came, it came out of the blue. 
you know, if you're down and you can see a reason why you should be down, then, then, then that brings with, uh, with it a certain clarity. But, but if, there's, if there's no reason, you tend to think, well, why, why on earth am I feeling like this? I don't understand. If left to your own devices, you can often try and stop um, the cycle of ups and downs through um, self-medication, ingestion of alcohol and narcotics, cocaine in particular. But with me, the depression came before the substance abuse. Right. Everyone thinks of depression as being a very low despondent mood, but there's agitated depression, there's psychomotor agitation where you're endlessly pacing and, uh, and you can't sleep and uh, uh, you're short-tempered. I rented a huge um, warehouse by the River Thames and uh, just stayed in there on my own and uh, didn't um, open any mail or answer any phone calls for months and months and months and just in this, in this pool of rapid cycling despair and... Uh, mania, three full bar optics of vodka um, <laughs> to try to get you um, uh, to sleep when you haven't been uh, to sleep for, for, for three days, just sort of spending time howling at the moon and throwing your furniture in the Thames. Uh, which, which what I did. Really? Which is what I did, so yes. Through, through all my electrical equipment in the Thames, a long time ago this was, with the river police going up and down with their megaphones saying, Tony, stop throwing things in the Thames. Did they know who you were? They, they recognised you. They, did. they said, there's that Tony Slattery. There's that Tony Slattery off the telly. Yes, that, was, that thankfully was a long time ago. That was, that, was a, that, was a, that was a dark hour. So I suppose what I'm leading to is this question, is that here's a button, and if I were to press that button, you would take away every aspect of your bipolarity to psychothymia. It's still not caused you the greatest happiness uh, over the years, but maybe it's had something to do with who you are. So do you want to press the button? No, I'll keep it. At the moment, because I'm in an equable state, I choose not to press the button, but I'd like to have the option. Do you know, almost everybody I've spoken to has said that. It says something about manic depression that, despite it being the greatest killer of all psychiatric illnesses, many of those suffering from it, if given a chance, don't want to get rid of it. If I'm honest, I don't. But I came across one woman who absolutely would press the button. Connie Perris lives in Birmingham and is just in her 40s. Her symptoms are so severe that she divides her life into before bipolarity and after. One of the difficulties is coming in here and feeling a bit paranoid. I see what I think is someone looking at me and I'm thinking, why is she looking at me? Well, why is he watching me? She's following me and I think, he's giving me funny looks. And I then clicks in the thinking, I'm getting paranoid again. Right. People give me funny looks because I'm giving them funny looks. Before, she was a lawyer, captain in the Territorial Army, a black belt in Aikido, and active in the community. Now, Connie can hardly get to the shops. When I'm very depressed, I slow down and slow down and slow down, and it gets to the point at which I'm just not moving at all. Inside my head, I can see, I can hear, but somehow I just don't have the energy or the oomph to move forward. And it can be a bit embarrassing when I'm out in the shops and I'm just stuck there, not moving. So can, can I, I yeah. before we do that, can I just pace up and down the corridor slightly because I'm getting quite shaky? Of course you can, absolutely. Sorry. No, no. I can feel the shakes getting slightly worse. So oh, if I'm I can sorry. just sort of have a have a pace. Yeah, breathe. just just Drink. pace. That that's um, a week's pills. Wow. That is quite a serious um, slab of medication, isn't it? Yeah. So there's two different ones that try to stop me going too high and too low. One slows down the swings, yeah. one stops it going too high. Stuff for my thyroid because that also slows the mood swings down. Mm. There's something to help me sleep and something to deal with the paranoia and other psychotic thinking. And then there's the mineral supplement to try and stop my hair falling out from the mood stabilisers. Golly wally. Every day. Every day. And in your depressions, have you considered, you know, the, the worst side of depression, which is suicide? Well, in a period of four days, I took an overdose. I stepped out in front of an oncoming train. 
I tried to drill a hole in my head with an electric drill and I cut my wrists. Dig a hole in your head with an electric drill. That's, that is extreme. I was just so utterly despairing. I didn't think I could take any more. How do you see the future? I don't see it. I try to take it a minute at a time because at the moment I don't see it. I'd like to. I really wish I could, but at the moment I don't. I so very much bitterly resent having manic depression. I wish I could say otherwise, but that's how I feel. Mm. I resent it deeply. It's perhaps a hard fact, but one we should face, that of those people who have severe bipolarity and aren't receiving treatment, half attempt suicide, and 20% succeed. Having met Connie, I realize I was lucky originally to be diagnosed at the mild end of the bipolar scale. But that was 11 years ago. Now I'm concerned to know how my way of dealing with it will affect my rating on Professor Craddock's scale of mania. Now zero on that scale is somebody who has absolutely no features of being bipolar at all. Mm. But between 1 and 39, that's somebody who has what we call subclinical episodes of, of mania. 40 to 59 on our scale is people who only get hypomanias, so that's the milder. Yeah episodes and then 60 and above is the range where people experience full manias from from what you've told me you you would score probably a, about 70 although to be honest i wonder if you got close to having grandiose delusions in that first episode if you did on our scale that would actually put you above 80 yeah Okay, well, yes, that's... Well, it's good to know I'm not wasting your time and that no. you like, <laughs> my little genes may be of some help to you in your, in your well. research. Well, I didn't expect that. It's worrying that I seem to be getting worse. Clearly, I must now consider treatment. I haven't been on any medication since my original diagnosis. Should I be? I think my life needs to change dramatically.